Well, good morning, church. How are you? Well, it's a great joy to be with you all today here in the Lord's house. It's always a, uh, a joy for me to be in the sanctuary and in the chapel earlier. Uh, as we've said over and over again, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers who are here uh, with their families. As my first official Father's Day, uh, my mind has been racing this week uh, just to fully grasp the profundity of what this day means. Uh, and, and I am, to be honest with you, overwhelmed uh, and speechless when, it, when I think about what it takes to be a good father, which is something I've taken some time to think about. Well, thankfully, I know that I have some great examples here at Park Cities. Uh, and so as a young father, I am grateful for your example uh, of what a godly dad looks like. And, uh, and I know that um, the Lord will, will be with me as, uh, as I walk in community with you. Well, today we are continuing with our series in the book of Matthew, and, and I hope that you've been blessed by it, but more importantly, I hope that it has encouraged you uh, to walk as Jesus calls us to walk. Um, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 19, so go ahead and turn to your Bibles, uh, turn, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 19, verses 16 through 30. Uh, we're going to read this passage all at once, so hold on tight. We're going we're gonna to go all the way through, and then uh, we'll continue on with our message. But this is the word of the Lord, Matthew 19, verses 16 and following. And behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will, inher and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this Father's Day, a reminder of all of the men who you've placed in our lives um, to help us grow in you. Lord, we're also reminded of how great of a father you are. Heavenly Father, we look to you now as we dive into your word. I pray that we would be transformed, not a single one of us leaving here the same way that we came in. That is our prayer today. Thank you, thank you for your word and the power that it has to change our hearts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, I was a part of a church that committed themselves to becoming a mobile church. And if you don't know what that is, it's exactly what it sounds. It's basically moving everything that makes a Sunday service a Sunday service from one location to the next every single week. So this meant that every Sunday we had equipment that 
we were loading in and out of trailers that we set up and broke down before and after services. And we did this for about eight months. And personally, it was the most physically exhausting ministry experience I had up until that point. Just to give you an idea of our routine, I remember the first few Sundays, I was waking up in the mornings around 2.30. That's about the time when I would wake up in order to get ready, get my breakfast, because I needed a big one, um, get ready and then head out to church. Uh, and, and then I needed to be there before 4.30, around four o'clock, so that we can load up our trailers, get to our outdoor venue, set up all of our equipment, and we had up until 9 a.m. to set everything up, do a sound check, a quick rehearsal, and then have our ministry teams in place. After about two services, and towards the end of this, we ended up with three services, uh, we had to break everything down, load up our trailer at the venue, drive back to our offices, unload our equipment, and head home. All in all, uh, I would get home uh, around four, sometimes five. Uh, when we had three services, I'd get home around six or seven sometimes. A pretty long day, if you ask me. Now, that might not sound like a big deal to some. In fact, I know a lot of churches who've been through that scenario before and for much longer. But as someone who had never even imagined this to be a reality in a church setting, it felt pretty overwhelming. And before launching into this, one way in which I needed to mentally and spiritually prepare for this season, I, I had to embrace the fact that I couldn't do this on my own. And it was not something I could do by sheer will and determination. It was clear to me from the very first few weeks of this that I needed help. Actually, given the gravity of what we needed to do on a weekly basis and how it was taking a toll on us physically, it was more like, I need salvation. And that was no joke. That's how desperate we were for help. And all of this pointed out something in me that I needed to acknowledge and thus work on. And that was, I need to learn how to ask for help. I need to learn how to ask for salvation. Because in times of desperation, salvation cannot come from within you. In other words, there are some things that you just won't be able to muscle your way through. Remember that statement. It's gonna come in handy when we close, and when I close my message. The fact is, this young man who spoke with Jesus assumed that eternal life could be earned through good works. He said, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And in this interaction with the rich young man, we learn what salvation looks like in the kingdom of God. In other words, what does it look like for a person to inherit eternal life? Is it something you can work really hard to attain? Perhaps it's something that you can gain through your good works. Or maybe your status on earth, or maybe how much money you have. Well, Jesus shatters this man's understanding of salvation and how one is saved. In fact, I believe through what he taught through this passage, we'll start to see a picture of a person who has eternal life and the characteristics that person should have as they live out that life. So I believe we see three. The first characteristic that we see from someone who has obtained eternal life is an unburdened heart. Again, this young man asked Jesus in verse 16, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Well, let's break down this question a bit before we continue on. As I've mentioned, this question assumed that eternal life could be earned through good works. In addition, it assumes that our doing is what allows eternal life to be gained. Well, Jesus' answer is then given according to the, the presuppositions and assumptions that underlines the questions of this rich young man. He essentially said that the commandments must be kept, to which this young man responded that he had kept those commandments. And Jesus listed in verses 18 through 19 all of those commandments, and yet when Jesus asked him to sell his belongings and follow him, this man's heart revealed that he had, in fact, not kept some of those commandments. How is that? 
While his inability to give to the poor revealed his inability to love his neighbor, also his love for his possessions, which prevented him from following Christ, could be argued it violated the first commandment. Now, did you catch the way that Jesus responded to the man regarding what this man lacked? Remember, this is in regards to obtaining eternal life, which was the original question. Jesus begins his answer with, if you would be perfect. In other words, when Jesus asked this man to sell his possessions and give them to the poor and then come and follow him, he was revealing to him, and this man knew in his heart, I believe, that he was not perfect which was in fact what is necessary to obtain eternal life. So knowing this, we might ask the same question that the disciples asked in verse 25, which was, who then can be saved? To this, Jesus responded, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In other words, we can't earn our salvation, but only through God's grace, amen? What a burden to carry if our salvation is dependent upon our perfection, which is not possible. For those who do in fact follow Jesus, we need to be reminded every day that we have an unburdened heart as those whose sins have been paid for. I'm reminded of that through verses like this one, Ephesians 2, eight through nine. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. How about this one for a reminder? Colossians chapter two, verses 13 through 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The weight of perfection was lifted when our sins were paid for by the Lamb of God. Those who are saved lived with an unburdened heart because we know that it is not about what we must do, but where we place our faith. And my prayer is that we would be reminded of this every single day. The gospel of Jesus Christ being reminded every single day of our lives until we meet Christ face to face. Well, those who have salvation not only have an unburdened heart, but they also have uncluttered hands. Now, I think it would be easy to focus on the idea of possessions after reading this passage and think that it is in the abundance of possessions that makes it difficult to be saved. Right? After all, Jesus said in verse 23 that only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. But by saying this, did Jesus mean that the level of difficulty of our salvation is based on how much we own or perhaps how much we make in a year? I don't think so. When Jesus asked this young man to sell his possessions and give it to the poor, I believe what he was doing was he was exposing an idol in his life. More specifically, I believe Jesus was exposing that which prevented this young man from the one thing that all disciples of Christ are called to do, which is to follow him. See, I think for all of us, following Jesus is not just a one-time decision, but an everyday decision that needs to happen. But in order for this to happen, so oftentimes we need to drop some things in order to follow. But those who are saved and are pursuing Jesus, I believe there is an aspect of simplicity to their lives. Now, this doesn't mean that you just get rid of things just for the sake of decluttering your house, which is pretty refreshing, might I add. I'm sure many of you have done that before, but simplicity means that we rid of things that prevent us from following Jesus. Now, maybe some of you today need to do some inward decluttering in order to follow Jesus. 
You see, to have uncluttered hands is to empty ourselves, not only of physical possessions, so that we can be filled with something else, namely whatever the Lord has for us. When it comes to pursuing simplicity, uncluttered hands opens our hands up to be filled with something that can help us pursue the kingdom. So then church, how will you empty your hands this week? And a follow-up question to this is how will you then utilize those uncluttered hands? Can I give you an example of how I've been challenged to do this in my own life? You know, I, I don't know about you, but in my times of devotion to the Lord, there are times when I find myself coming into God's presence with a lot of agendas, with a laundry list of things that I, that I just need to get off my chest. And even when I begin with God's word, I, I come not only with a cluttered mind, but I come with cluttered prayers. I find myself full of anxious thoughts and feelings and then I leave wonder, wondering if I had even heard from the Lord at all. There are a lot of days like that. When we consider the busy nature of our minds, we might realize just how complex and cluttered our lives are. When our minds are uncluttered, our hands follow as we have more margin to follow Jesus by living the ways of Christ. You know, I love what Richard Foster said about simplicity because he said that this was actually a spiritual discipline that we can, all, we can all follow. And he said this about simplicity. He said, the inward reality of simplicity involves a life of joyful unconcern for possessions. Neither the greedy nor the miserly know this liberty. It has nothing to do with abundance of possessions or their lack. It is an inward spirit of trust. I believe that those with uncluttered hands display an inward spirit of trust. Isn't that how we follow Jesus, church? The way we put one foot in front of the other as we follow Christ is trusting him one day at a time. Which leads us to the last characteristic of those who have salvation. They not only have unburdened hearts, and uncluttered hands, but they also have unimpeded feet. The disciples were quick to remind Jesus in verse 27 that they did indeed do what this young man was not able to do, which was drop everything and follow him. And that is indeed what was done by many of you who have been saved by faith in Christ. You have forsaken the ways of the world and have essentially committed to make Jesus Lord or ruler of your life. And praise God for that. However, once a decision is made to follow Jesus, is that really it? If you're a believer, you know that's not it. To have unimpeded feet is to continually move in the direction of where Christ is leading. When Jesus invited this young man to follow him in verse 21, it was not just a passport into heaven, but rather an invitation to begin a lifelong journey with him. I love what Dallas Willard said about this. He explained it in this way. He said, salvation as conceived today is far removed from what it was in the beginnings of Christianity. And only by correcting it can God's grace and salvation be returned to the concrete embodiment existence of our human personalities, walking with Jesus in his easy yoke. In other words, Willard was essentially saying that salvation is not just about forgiveness, but it's about a new order of life, that easy yoke. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A new order of life makes sense for a new creation. This is why following Jesus is ongoing. Who are you, church, following nowadays? Are your feet following the ways of this world? Or can you truly say that you are following Jesus the way a new creation is expected to follow him. 
So then the question to answer for you today is this, what is keeping your feet from walking towards Jesus today? This is not a popular thing to do. That is consistently making Jesus Lord of your life in every area of your life with every task, relationship, and calling that you are called to. In other words, unimpeded feet means that you are not in charge. Unimpeded feet means that your possessions do not come before God or anything for that matter. Verse 22 tells us that when Jesus asked this young man to sell his possessions and follow him, he went away from Jesus. He walked away from Jesus sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That is, the idol of his possessions kept him from following Jesus. So I ask again, what is keeping your feet from walking towards Jesus? You know, I found it interesting that Jesus used the illustration of the camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. He's saying here that it's impossible for someone consumed with riches and their possessions to enter into the kingdom of God. I think the reason this is the case is because riches have the tendency of leading us to believe that we have no need for Jesus. Isn't that how riches works in possession sometimes? Now I was reminded of of that, as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of the judgment spoken against the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3.17, which says this, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Oh, may we never prosper in a way that leads us to blindness in ignorance of our desperate need for our Savior every single day. The one who calls us to depend on and follow every day of our lives. May we as individuals and as a church body follow Jesus with unimpeded feet. So a quick recap. We've learned that those who would inherit eternal life or those who have obtained salvation have really three characteristics that are not only displayed once when they become saved, but will continually display as they live their lives. These characteristics are an unburdened heart, uncluttered hands, and unimpeded feet. Now, whether these are good reminders for those who are believers or perhaps new information for those who are not, what I want to do right now is I want to explain to you why knowing these characteristics matter, and they do. It matters because at some point in your life, church, you'll reach a season or situation that you won't be able to muscle your way through. This message is about one thing. It's about God's salvation. When we are unable to muscle our way through with our strength and accomplishments or possessions or money or status, we can be saved by God and God alone. It's clear from our passage that, that none of us can be perfect, especially when it comes to our ability to enter into the kingdom of heaven on our own merit. That's just not going to be possible. And much like my experience with the mobile church, you will be overwhelmed by something at some point in your life. At some point, you will realize the need for salvation. You know that saying, God will never give you more than you can handle? Baloney. <laughs> Just baloney. Some of the greatest victories in life come when you are given more than you can handle because it takes God to save you in order for you to get through. I know that some of the greatest victories in my life have come when I could not outmuscle, outsmart, or outwork my way through. Those victories came when I was desperate enough to call out for salvation, and I give God all the glory for that. Well, here's the truth. When it comes to the question of eternal life, we all need salvation, and it does not come with your good works. It comes through Jesus. 
his work on the cross, his victory over the grave, and our response of faith to Jesus. And when it comes to our salvation, it's true when Jesus said in verse 26, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And perhaps like this rich young man, you've been thinking seriously about the issue of eternal life. If you are not a believer here today, man, I wanna invite you to know him, not just to obtain eternal life, but to know Jesus and the life that you can have with him. I believe that with God, salvation is possible for you today. No matter what you have done, no matter what your past looks like, I believe that salvation is possible with God and in him alone. If you are already a believer, you may feel overwhelmed from this season. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a situation at work. Maybe it's an overwhelming financial situation. Maybe you're in debt right now. Maybe it's a family member who's physically ill and there's nothing you can do about it. If there's anything I know about our Lord, it's that he is close to the brokenhearted. And he desires for us to call out to him. Won't you call out to him today? When there's truly nothing we can do with our own power, with our own finances or intelligence, we can ask God to save us. And my prayer is that that's where we would go. I think in addition to this, we can lean on the shoulders of those around us here at Park Cities. If you're not in a connect group, get into a connect group. There are people who can walk with you who can do life with you. If there's anything we've learned from the pandemic, from, from being locked in because of COVID, it's that doing life alone is, well, first of all, it's, it's miserable, but it just cannot be done. Church, we need each other, amen? We need our community and we need the Lord. So can I pray for us? I want to ask us to do one thing as, as I close in prayer. I want us to respond somehow before the Lord. Um, something that I like to ask the church to do uh, in response to prayer is to, if you need prayer, and I want to pray over you right now, I want to pray for you. I just don't want to pray to end the message. I want to pray for you right now. And, and, if, and if you feel that, that you've been convicted or you feel the Lord is leading you to action, I want to pray for you that you might be obedient before him. So if that is you, whether you're a believer or you, you're not a believer and you want to know who Jesus is, I want to invite you to just place your hand gently over your heart. And I just want to pray over you. And I believe that God hears our hearts as we pray. So let me pray for us. And then uh, we'll close our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done. Lord, we know that salvation comes from you and there's nothing we can do to earn it. For many of us, Lord, we have been in that place where we've been overwhelmed, where we couldn't outmuscle or outthink our way through a situation. Some of us are there right now. Lord, if there's any person in this room with their hands over their hearts, Lord, you know their story. You know their hearts. And you know what they're going through right now. Lord, I pray that you would remind them, Holy Spirit, would you convict their hearts right now so that they may call out to you. Lord, for those who have their hands over their hearts, maybe, Lord, they don't know you at all. And their idea of salvation, their idea of eternal life was that of works not of faith or grace, I pray that you'd be with them as well. Lord, may it be that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would put their faith and trust in you. And I pray that, Lord, that they would walk towards you with unimpeded feet as a result. Thank you for this message of salvation and for reminding us of the fact that we need you regardless of the kind of season that we're in. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.